but let me say a few words about the energy. If you have, if you have a, the word line of a particle, and you <coughs> parameterize the word line by its proper time measure along that wave line, and then you de define the tangent vector to that curve, you can associate to, the, to a particle of mass m the momentum pa equal m pa. An observer that happens to cross that work line with a velocity u a would assign to this particle here in the exact same sense as, a, as, as it occurs in, in, in special relativity, I can now think of construct a local inertial frame here and describe that for that velocity and this momentum in, 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 in let's say the coordinates appropriate for, for that inertial frame. And I would see that the energy that this observer would assign to this particle is simply minus UA PV. GA. Okay, so this is the metric at that point. This is this form momentum that characterizes the particle, and this is the unit vector that characterizes the motion of the observer. However, as we saw last time, this is not something that can in general be expanded to in the way we do it in, 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 in let's say even in special relativity. For instance, if if my observer is here, moving with a four velocity UA tilde, there is no natural expression for what this ob observer would assign to this particle as an energy. Okay? There is, first of all, no way, no, no natural way to go so. Um, so energy is something that can, in, in a sense, loses its general meaning that, 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 uh, that, that we have in special relativity. However, when the space time is such that you have some manner in, in which you transform, displace the space time, produces something like a displacement, uh, in, well, yeah, a, a displacement, and the space time does not change. In other words, the metric is invariant under this transformation. You say you have a killing field, or you have an isometry of the space time. And when you have a killing field, it turns out that you can generically associate with that killing field, okay, so this is the notion of killing field. Killing field, let me, let me say what? And it's just the guy's name. It's the guy's <laughs> name, but nothing to do with any, with any unsolved murder. <laughs> okay, uh, so here is your space time, you have a metric on it, and <clears throat> imagine that you have some manner in which you can map points to other, into other points in the space time in such a way that the metric remains invariant when you do that. So you have like a displacement or translation. If you do this infinitesimally, that is characterized by what we call a killing field. So it's an infinitesimal displacement that represents a change in the space time that, is, that leaves the metric invariant. When you have such a thing, then there is a quantity that is conserved for the motion of the particle, which is basically, and now let me put it with a field there, minus PA CB. Okay, so this is an energy. It's, it's almost the energy that would be measured by somebody that moves with this four velocity, except that generically this is not normalized to unit. Right? So if if you want to convert this to an, into an energy that is actually being measured by somebody, you have to produce this quantity that is normalized which would be CB, UA, GAB, sorry. Uh, divided by the norm of the side. So 
Okay? That would be the energy that is measured by somebody whose form velocity is this. Now that quantity is a unit vector, and it could be the form velocity of somebody. Of course, if it could be a form velocity of somebody if it's a time-like vector. Nevertheless, this quantity, quantity, we call it an energy, even though unless it happens to be unit, it's not the energy measured by anybody. It's a, it's a constant of the motion of particles that follow geodesics. So what happens when you have a, black, a, a stationary black hole that is rotating is that this object is not time-like in all of the space time. It's time-like far away from the black hole, but there is a region that is exterior to the black hole where this object is space-like. In other words, nobody can move, not even in that direction. But nevertheless, the constant of motion, the constant of motion for, for, a, free part, for a free particle remains this quantity, has this value. And if this guy is the killing field that, it, that represents station, stationarity and it corresponds to the to, to at infinity to a unit vector, then this energy, if the particle ever reaches infinity, this would represent the energy that is measured by somebody moving along that killing field of that particle that reaches infinity. Or it's almost, it's almost the quantity that is measured by somebody that is sufficiently far away. The point is that this quantity, however, need not be positive definitely, definite, even though this is the normal momentum of a, of, of a particle. Because inside the, this ergosphere, this quantity can take any value simply because now this vector is, is space-like. So you can, you, know, you can arrange it to have any value. Then, if you have a black hole of this rotating, stationary black hole of this rotating, this is, this is meant to be an instantaneous picture or something analogous to that, of the horizon and the region inside which this field takes, becomes space-like. That's called the ergosphere. Okay? So now imagine that I arrange to throw two particles from infinity with energies E1 and E2. Can I just, just the yes. ergosphere is always outside the event horizon. The ergosphere is, by definition, the region outside the event horizon where the heat, where the killing field has become space-like. But it, is it ever possible that inside the event horizon? Just in the, the in the event horizon, in the inside the event horizon, generically it's time-like. Generically, it's generically it's space -like. it's space -like. it's space -like. generically space-like. It's space-like. Generically space-like. But see. inside okay. the event horizon, well, normally we don't care because we okay. can't reach it. But, you, but, but, but yeah, that's going to segue into this idea that you have negative energies of things that fall into the Okay, good. Thank okay. you. So imagine, so the peculiarity of a rotating black hole is that even outside the event horizon you have this region. Now imagine that you throw two particles and Manage to arrange a collision so that one of the particles, one of the other particles, acquires inside the collision what would be an energy with the wrong side, which can happen. It will not happen. It will not happen to the particles that have here because this particle is moving. This energy was positive. This quantity is constant all the time, so this particle has a positive energy always. This particle has a positive energy. But now, they collided inside here. At the point, in, in the region around the collision, you can create a local inertial frame, and simply you have momentum conservation there. The scattering produces you know, standard two-particle collision, two-particle collision. But you have arranged the scattering to be such 
that this particle moves in this region with some energy that is smaller than zero. Let's call it E prime. And then the other particle will come out here. That particle will have energy because here the fact that energy, is cons energy momentum is conserved will ensure that the energies add up to the conserved quantity. But the energy of this particle coming here is going to be E1 plus E2 plus E prime. So that the total, ener the total energy E is exactly the same at the beginning. But what happened, you have extracted energy E prime from the black hole. And I, I take it, in order for this to happen, the particle that goes in is as it were going contrary to the direction of rotation and you're going to reduce L as well. Right. Okay. And, and eventually will actually move into the yeah. falling to that one cannot that one cannot escape. Okay. <coughs> okay. So when this issue was this issue was pointed out by Perkos, it became important to decide, okay, is a rotating black hole an infinite source of energy? And then that made the study of black hole thermodynamics very relevant. And one of the outcomes of those studies is, is no, it's not an infinite source of energy. You can extract energy from a black hole, but to a certain amount, because as you, as you mentioned, when you do that, you, people analyze how this process needs to be, how this particle needs to be moving, and it turns out to uh, uh, inject mo momentum, angular momentum in the opposite direction, and if this is conserved, then the black hole has to start slowing down, and it starts this, uh, slowing down, the atmosphere starts to decrease, and so forth. So is, is it minus the heat ground so that it is positive? Uh, because the heat ground is we're right. It's minus. It's minus. It's minus. It's minus. It's minus. Yes. Sorry. It's minus prime, but it's, it's, it's minus prime, but this is bigger than yeah. one plus two. Yes. Okay. So let me review for you the the laws of black hole mechanics without getting into it. So the starting point is you want to start study stationary black holes. Stationary black holes are supposed to be black holes after they have settled down. You expect them to become uh, stationary. Everything that could be swallowed would be swallowed. Everything that would be could be radiated would be radiated. And the thing is expected to settle down into a stationary situation. And the stationarity is represented by the fact that there is this killing field that is at infinity looks like a time translation. At infinity, the space then becomes flat, uh, and this looks like a time translation. And then there is a theorem by Cocky showing that if you have a stationary uh, black hole and certain energy conditions are satisfied, then <coughs> if the, the, the horizon of the black hole needs to be needs to be a killing horizon, which means it's, a, it's an horizon for which there is a killing field that is tangent to the horizon. And that, then there are two possibilities. Either that coincides with the first case, and then you have a static black hole. Or there is another field which uh, is a, it corresponds to rotation, and then the black hole is uh, axisymmetric, station, stationary and axisymmetric. And then you have the theorems that show you that in the vacuum case or the electrohub case, this is the Reiner, Reisner, Nordstrom, uh, black hole. But the point is that that particular uh, uh, that there is a particular combination between these two fields that is known on the horizon, so it goes along the node generators of the horizon, and that quantity and that object allows you to define this quantity, which is called the surface gravity, and then the theorem, the theorem indicates also that this quantity is constant over the event horizon. So this looks like this quantity kappa, which is now constant over the whole event horizon, uh, is behaving like the like temperature. Then, Okay, so this 
pertains only to stationary black holes. Then there is a theorem that pertains to much more general situations, which is Hawking's area theorem, that tells you the following, that if energy satisfies some reasonable conditions and you have an hypersurface on which you have on which you have black hole, a collection of black holes, certain area, and then if and then set type of surface in the future, in which you have another collection, perhaps two of them have not merged, or something of that sort. Right, you have two of these black holes merged for instance into this one, this one. It's always the case that if you add the total area of the black holes on this hypersurface is always less or equal than the total area of the black holes on this hypersurface, and that indicates that area is behaving like something monotonic with growing. Yes? Can you just say what the energy conditions there need to be Well, the, the energy conditions are the null energy conditions that basically require you that when you have a null vector, uh, Ka is, is, is null, then Ka, Kb times Tab is bigger than zero. I'm using the right one. I, I, I always forget the conversion. Okay. Those are future directions. Right. No, but if it's the same, it's always possible. Oh, right. so it's it's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I just ask a question? The level of analogy here strikes me as extraordinarily weak. I mean, for example, you say, well, in this condition, the surface gravity is constant over the horizon, so it's like a temperature. Well, if, if you have you know, a, a conducting sphere and you throw some charges on it and let it equilibrate, the charges will you know, equidistribute around it. So it would also be, I, I wouldn't say, gee, that's like a temperature. I mean, it's like a whole bunch of things in equilibrium. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 but, but let me give you a little okay. more. Okay. So far, it's just an and, 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 and even And even, even after the two other laws that I'm going to tell you, people still thought, oh, well. And, 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 and this one about you know, the, the, the area is, well, if, if just you say, look, well, the area is proportional to the mass. If two of them com combine, their masses combine, the area is going to go up. Okay. Well, that's not true. The point is that this is true for not for stationary black holes. It's for any black hole. And the area is proportional to the mass for a stationary, for a static care black hole. Mm -hmm. It's not proportional to the mass. Not even okay, for, for a static for, for Schwarzschild black hole, the area is proportional to the, to the mass squared. Yeah. For a rotating black hole, it's not proportional just to the mass. It's okay. a more complicated thing. Mm -hmm. And for black holes that are dynamical, that are not in the care sh sh uh, in, the, in, in mm -hmm. that class, it could be anything. It uh -huh. could be anything. It okay. may have absolutely no relation with. with uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. That's all. I haven't learned to use this machine. another thing which I think mean, makes the analogy a little bit stronger, which is what is called the first law of black hole mechanics. It's here, it's appearing in the, in the sorry, the second law of black hole mechanics. And if you have any stationary black hole and you perturb it infinitesimally, but to any other black hole, then the change in the mass and area and angular momentum and charge are related by that simple expression. This is true for arbitrary variations of an equilibrium situation. So it's not just a, for a variation from one equilibrium situation to another equilibrium situation. It's true for arbitrary variations starting from an equilibrium situation. So this now resembles well, if you identify mass with energy, it's a change of energy, something that looks like 
we said temperature multiplied by this quantity of things to increase. And then things that you can see that they are like work terms. They are work terms, this is rotational work, angular velocity times the change in, in uh, angular momentum, and this is uh, the electromagnetic. work done by, by, by electromagnetic forces. And then, then there's a, a, third, uh, a third result, which indicates that there is no physical process that can bring a black hole to, uh, starting from a black hole that has kappa bigger than zero, to a process to, to the value that kappa is equal to zero. This is not the kind of law as the other three ones. This is just supported by a lot of anecdotal evidence. These other three things are theories. Right? And then you see that there is a complete analogy with, with the laws of, of, of thermodynamics. Uh, and this suggested to people early on, actually Bekenstein was the first one to, to indicate that that perhaps we should think the temperature, uh, somehow the surface gravity of a black hole represents something similar to the temperature and the area is something similar to the entropy. But of course, at that point, it was nothing but an analogy, a strong analogy, if you want, because now I think it's much, much stronger than, but simply an analogy because how can a black hole have a temperature? If the black hole doesn't have a temperature. If it had a temperature, it would radiate. It doesn't radiate. So then, of course, a few years later comes Hawking's derivation of of, of Hawking's effect, indicating that the actual that the black stationary black hole actually radiates in this fashion. This <coughs> So this not only gave uh, the proportionality constant, because the, at this point it's only proportionality that exists, you don't know what the proportionality because There are a bunch of constants that I have left out, h-bars, <coughs> h-bar, uh, Boltzmann constant that I can see around there that I have put all of them equal to one. And then that gave the proportionality constant that set one quarter as the relation between entropy mm -hmm. and the black hole. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so at this point, I, I, I arrived here to this, this uh, point that I think it's convenient to demystify, but I don't know, well, I imagine people have, do not know about quantum field theory in curved space time and this is at the core of the derivation, so I thought they would give a short description of, 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 the, of the story and, and why, how it happens that there is this effect of Hawking. <coughs> I mean, this is it's, it's so important, this is an extremely important part of the puzzle. If you do not buy this puzzle, then it, you only have an analogy. Okay, let me first say how you treat quantum fields in flat space time. And is everybody here familiar with quantum fields in flat space time? Please raise the hand and anybody that would like to me to say something about flat quantum field theories in flat space time. has gauge invariance, has a vector index, and has all sorts of 
issues that probably. This, so think, think if you want, if you will, for, for conceptual purposes that you are dealing with the electric field, the electromagnetic field, but instead we have this simplified version, which we call phi, is a, is a, we call it a clean Gordon field, and it's supposed to satisfy this equation, which in the in the case of the electromagnetic field would be the Maxwell Maxwell's equation for the vector potential, let's say. <coughs> So the objective is to construct, the objective is to, is to construct an, an operator because in the same way that we have replaced in quantum mechanics position of the particles and momenta of the particles by operators, we now want to represent my variable, which is the quantum field, by an operator. The, the same way that the particles here are labeled by an index i telling me which particle I'm talking about, the label here is x, the point in space that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is the quantum field. <coughs> it's convenient to work, when you want to work with quantum fields, and especially in, in, in relativity, to go to the uh, Heisenberg picture in which the operators themselves acquire time dependence. So I go from the Schrodinger operators to the, into the IHTX. Sorry, this is the Heisenberg. This is the Schrodinger operator. Don't trust my signs, the minus signs, I will call it the Okay. <clears throat> and then your field becomes an operator that depends both on space and time, and you want to try to, to construct this object. And, <clears throat> and at the same time, you want to construct the thing that would be the momentum conjugate to this, which in this case is the time derivative, which I'm, for which I'm going to put the dot, which is going to, I'm going to call it pi, x and, and t. And you want to impose commutation relations analogous to the commutation relations between these two. The way to proceed in this case is to first do <coughs> pass to a Fourier decomposition of this object. So I will put everything inside the box and will add over momentum moment k and will write this as e to the i k x phi k t. Okay, so simply change is a simple change of variables. And then when I try to, to construct the computation relations between the field and its momentum conjugate and impose the type of the natural commutation relations analogous to the ones I have here. Right? Between particles and its momentum, I will have I will have to say xi with pj, the commutator of this is i delta ij. So here, in the case of the fields, the labels were my x's. So I will require that commutator of, of the field at x with the momentum conjugate at that same point is a delta and otherwise it vanishes. Right? The particle has non trivial commutation relations with the momentum conjugate. Well, the point is that when I, when I arrive to this object, this object has a Hamiltonian, when I look at what's the equation of motion or a Hamiltonian that, that describes the behavior of this object, is exactly that of the harmonic oscillator. And the harmonic oscillator is something I know how to deal with. I know that the harmonic oscillator, I create this, so, so for the harmonic oscillator, I have one half uh, uh, square over m plus k x square. I know I can construct this creation and annihilation operators that are, well, these operators that are combinations of x, I don't remember the coefficient,
coefficients x and x and b with the topic of coefficients and its momentum conjugate. And these operators satisfy very simple commutation relations. And this allows me to create to say I'm going to pro propose that there is a state called the vacuum. And out of this state that is the vacuum, which is this defined by the property that A acting on the vacuum is zero, I can construct the full Hilbert space by applying these creation operators, which correspond to exciting the harmonic oscillator to even higher levels. Right? So you have the harmonic oscillator in its ground state, it's like excited once, excited twice, excited. And from this formalism, you can, of course, go over the standard, the standard description in terms of wave function of uh, expressed in position space, let's say, of the harmonic state. So the idea is that since these guys have exactly the same commutation relations as the, as the harmonic oscillators, one does precisely, one does precisely, tries to precisely reproduce that. And, then, and ends up writing, after the whole story, ends up writing this as a sign of, over k, of creation operator multiplied by e to the i k x minus omega t, where omega, where omega is the square root of k squared plus m squared plus a without, sorry, a k, a k e to the minus i. Okay, this procedure then successfully realizes this, this task of creating these operators if I define the Hilbert space in precise analogy with the Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator, except that now I have a very large collection of harmonic oscillators, actually an infinite collection labeled by K. So now the state the vacuum state, the starting point of the construction of the Hilbert space, is to say, I define the vacuum state characterized by the property that this is equal to zero for, for every k. And then the elements or the basis of the Hilbert space is obtained by acting with creation operators of different k's, in other words, exciting different different harmonic oscillators to arbitrary levels. And this produces, this construction produces a Hilbert space on which this object, this field acts and has commutation relations as the side. Okay? So now my Hilbert space is is a state that contains the vacuum and contains the excitation of all the harmonic oscillators that are, that are present and every possible combination what is the proposition of them. Okay? I'm sorry, I think everybody is falling asleep. <laughs> well, what's the problem? We want to do this in curved space by now. So in curved space time now, you do exactly the same procedure, except that in here, I use a very, very important aspect of the story. I selected the, I chose to write things in terms of these variables that behave exactly as harmonic oscillators, and are associated with solutions that evolve in time as e to the minus i omega t. And those are solutions called of positive energy. So I associate with the creation operators things with positive energy and with the annihilation operators things with negative energy. And since I know what energy is, I can do a very clear 
Yes. Can you briefly say uh, what physical picture I should have in mind that's then combining with all this math? I mean, I have some of flat space time and then these operators. So what, what is so what is physically? So okay, so you're not describing space time. Space time is, is a flat space time in cosmic space time. And now you're describing the states of this object we call the field. And it has been decomposed into these harmonic oscillators. Each one of them, when you can be excited or not excited. When you excite one of them with wave function with value k, somehow you have excited over the whole space time a mode of the field that has that particular wave mode. Combining these things, you can create configurations, for instance, semi-classical configurations, in which the field is different from zero in this region and zero almost everywhere. Right? I can combine in the Fourier way things that approach a classical configuration that has that feature, right? So this would be the analogous of saying I have created the state of, the, of the, my particle, which is highly localized here. But in general, it will not be highly localized there. It will be something. Well, the field is now, the localization in the field is in the field variable. So the question is, what is the, you know, classical, you could, think of possible classical configurations of the field, which would be the field given at every point, except that now it's quantum mechanical. So it's not completely definite, let's say, at that point, but it's, it's fuzzy around certain values around that point. And it could be extremely fuzzy, right? like, like the position of a particle can be extremely, extremely. Can I just also, I just want to make sure I'm following. Uh, you Shown to be a 
independent, if you compute it at any hyper surface, the value you get for that product is the same. And this product, this allows me, this is going to be the basis of my construction of the single particle Hilbert space, which could, could correspond to the single particle, the single harmonic oscillator here. Just one, uh, it's one of them. Well, <coughs> and I will need to uh, make the choice of these of this solutions that appear here so in such a way that they have positive norm in this, in this inner product. So that's the restriction for the thing to work consistently. They have to choose solutions that have positive norm. These solutions that have positive energy automatically have positive norm, but uh, there are other solutions that have positive norm. <coughs> but otherwise, I can choose them arbitrarily. But once I have chosen a collection, a complete collection of solutions that have positive norm, the, the complex conjugate would have negative norm. Okay? So it's, it's going to be very important that I associate with ones with creator operators or ones with annihilation operators. But given that choice, I can now write the field, the quantum field, in this way, in terms of creation operators, annihilation operators, multiplied by these mole functions in exactly the same way that I did here, except that now the moles are characterized by a parameter alpha and not necessarily of this form. If I normalize, if I choose to normalize things appropriately, then the commutation relations that I that I wrote before, transform these commutation relations between the operator, transform into the standard commutation relations by my, for my, my operators. And then I proceed as before. I have the same mathematics and I do exactly the same. I create this quantity called, this object called the Fox space, which is to say, I will start by an object which I call the vacuum, which is defined by the property that is annihilated by all alphas. And out of that, I will create the Hilbert space by acting on it, exciting this vacuum in arbitrary ways, and then looking at all the co combinations. I have an inner product, and I can look at all the combinations, complete the, 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 the well, look at all finite combinations, and then complete the space actually becomes Hilbert space, then to complete the space will become the Hilbert space. And now we have a Hilbert space where my, my object, my field and momentum conjugated act. I know how to act. How it acts because I know how these operators act on the vacuum and on each one of this, the states that form the basis that I just wrote. Once this is done, I can, for instance, write oper interesting operators that they make a momentum tensor operator, which has this expression. It needs to be renormalized, but that's a technical complication which I will not get into. Uh, and I can write in principle, well, this is one of the most interesting things, most relevant things, but I can write other, other uh, interesting operators associated with the, with, with the field. For instance, if it was the, the electromagnetic field, I would be able to I would be able to write the electric field operator at the point X, or the magnetic field operator, and so forth. And therefore, we'll be able to tell you if the state is such and such, the probability that if you measure the electric field here, you will obtain this result is such and such. So exactly the same story. OK. The problem arises because in this construction, since I didn't tell you since I didn't tell you how to choose these solutions, these small solutions, I can now choose them arbitrarily. Actually, if I chose one set of solutions, I could produce a new set of solutions combining one of them with its complex conjugate. One with, would have been positive energy if it was this, with one of this sort, which is negative energy. And as long as this operator satisfies this property, this, pro this also has positive norm. 
So I'm free to do this, to construct a new set of modes, and proceed as before with the new set of modes. So I now write the, my, my scalar field in exactly the same way, but with new objects. And I will end up constructing, <coughs> since it's the same field, I can rewrite one in terms of the other. I mean, I can, I can since this object is, this, the, is supposed to be the, a different expression for the same quantity as before, I can see the relationship between the creation and annihilation operators. And the point is the following. An annihilation operator of the new construction is now a combination of the annihilation operator of the previous construction plus creator operator. Therefore, the fact that this guy acting on the vacuum gave zero does not mean that this guy acting on the vacuum is zero. In other words, you have two different vacuum, two different constructions that give you two different notions of what is vacua, of, of what is a one-particle excitation, of what is a two-particle excitation, and so forth. And this ambiguity, in general, you cannot, there is no way to resolve it. You don't resolve it. There are ways to bypass the fact that you don't resolve it, but let me not get into it. Let me now get into Okay, but, but, but the fundamental lesson from this story is that in curved space time, according to quantum field theory, there is no notion of vacuum. There is no notion of a one particle state. Those notions are ambiguous. And you can, I mean, the, when I'm saying there is no notion, is that there are infinite notions and are completely ambiguous, and they don't map one into the other. Even in flat space time, we have a version of this story, which is the famous Umbro effect. We don't like Umbro very much, but this is this part of the work is perfectly. <laughs> is the fact that observers, if you try to write Minkowski space time, flat Minkowski space time, and use coordinates that are appropriate or natural for for the description of the space time that would be given by accelerated observers, then what looks like the vacuum in in the for, for, for an inertial observer, looks like a thermal state for this uh, accelerator observer. So, so even in flat space time, you have that problem. Can, in you, flat can, can I just object to that statement? Just, I, I don't yes. want to get involved in your but I, I just want to ask you. Yes. Um, if, I have a, if I have a machine to detect in part of the screen or whatever the hell it is, it comes with operating. Like the operating directions might say, do not accelerate or this thing will screw up. Yeah. And if it has that instruction on it, then even Unru observers were going to say, don't trust that thing. Fine. OK, good. I have, no, I have no problem with that. Good, good, good. Of course, the problem here is that generic, in, in that case, you say, well, do not accelerate. Here, I don't know what. You would say, how do I fill the universe naturally with observers that do not accelerate? Very, I mean, put, can put observers to move geodesically, but probably they will not, and they, they, they will you know, do those very strange things. My right? point was the phrase looks like a vacuum. It, it doesn't look like a vacuum if you know you're accelerating. I'm not saying you have to go to a non accelerator Go to an accelerating observer. Take the damn thing and spin it. If you know what's going to happen physically if I spin it in a vacuum, then what looks like a vacuum is whatever happens when you spin it. Um, it it's just in a very naive sense you say it looks like a vacuum, because either you're getting or not getting hits, but you don't stop. It's like a measurement problem, right? You don't stop and try and analyze the measurement as a physical effect, taking into account the physical state of the instrument. That's yeah, okay. If, if your instrument comes with the instructions, do not accelerate, I agree. If you construct something, some toy model object, let's say a two level, and propose a type of interaction, you can say, well, what would happen if I do accelerate? Mm -hmm. And the, the result is that if you do that, this thing behaves as if it was being hit by a thermal cloud. 
situations in which you are we're in much better shape. We're, there are situations in which the space time is almost, and I'm going to forget the word almost, is actually stationary at, at an early time, for instance. And then I can produce the whole procedure in this way, choosing things with positive energy and doing everything kosher, no problem, in the early times. But if it, if it was not exactly stationary, so it started moving and, uh, and moving faster and faster and faster, and then it went to a regime that it stopped being stationary. Something dramatic happened, and then settled down into another stationary state. Mm -hmm. Then I have two constructions. One, early on, with the notion, with my notion of energy and my notion of vacuum. The second construction, Late on with my new, but all these constructions are valid everywhere because I chose the solutions that were positive energy in the past, but then I continue their solutions. I can choose the solutions that are positive energy in the future and I continue them to the past. Right. But the relationship between the positive energy solutions in the past and the positive energy solutions in the future is a complex one. The one that was positive energy in the past does not behave as pure positive energy in the future. It behaves as a combination of positive and negative energy in the future. And then I, I have the situation that I had before, but now, in some sense, enforced by my notions of energy that are appropriate to the past and to the future. And under those conditions, it's very clear, the vacuum of the past is not going to be the vacuum in the future. And then you have Part of creation. And this is precisely what happens with Hawking effect. You have a space time that is basically a big cloud of very non dense, not, not very dense, very. What's the word? When, 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 you, speak, when, you, when you speak of particle creation, yeah. what you mean is the, the, uh, uh, the vacuum, say, of the past is going to count relative to the what's identified as the vacuum state in the future as a state with particles. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. right. Is, is there in addition conditions at space like infinity that allow you to, for example, I mean, if everything went kind of flat, if you were an island universe and went kind of flat, then you could as also be flat. As as flat. flat. Then you could also demand that the the slicing early and the slicing late, if I just forget the middle, that they kind of revolve by a, that they match up. Because you could imagine starting this way early and ending up that way late. And that's going to change mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of judgments too. But if you have, if you go asymptotically flat, is there an additional condition at least that there's that kind of, do you see what I'm saying? Kind of matching? At, at space like infinity? We, we, that's what we do in the case of black holes. We look at asymptotically flat space times, continue to evolve into asymptotically flat space time. So now, now let me now give, I'm going to try to show the picture of the black hole, of what, yes. what's happening. Um, but okay, this is what, this is what I, what, 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 what I, 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 I just described in general. In the case of the black hole, I'm, I'm, going, I'm not going to escape your question. But in, in the case, for everybody, as in the case of, of the black hole, we, we start with the cloud, a very, a very non dense, what's the opposite of dense? Uh, the, um, yeah, uh, dilute, a dilute, a dilute, a dilute, very dilute cloud of gas, almost stationary, almost stationary, the space time is basically, and it has a killing field, has a notion of energy. Now the cloud starts going and undergoing gravitational collapse. A black hole forms, all hell breaks loose, but eventually the black hole settles. All, run, all the all, all the waves that the black hole created when it's formed are running away, and now you are settled back into a situation in which you are basically stationary in the outside of the black hole, only in the exterior part of the black hole. And now you have a notion of of positive energy both in the whole past and in the exterior region. Of the black hole. In the interior region, you don't. In the interior region, you're, 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 you're still don't know what, 
there are always budget for the students and you know. And that and and under those conditions, this is precisely the story that I just told you precisely it did happen. You started with the vacuum, so if I, I ignore, for instance, the cloud was of dust, and I'm talking talk about the electromagnetic field, and the dust didn't have anything to do with the electromagnetic field. Then my electromagnetic field was in the vacuum state, and at the end, because of this, you end up in the exterior region with an electric field, electromagnetic field that is in a state filled with particles, which is actually a terminal state because you need to train. If you want to describe only what's happening outside, you trace over the degrees of freedom that are in, inside. You, you break down the system into two subsystems, the parts, the degrees of freedom, the field degrees of freedom corresponding to the exterior region and the field degrees of freedom corresponding to the interior region. You separate it, you start with the pure state. Of course, the full state in the microsurface is pure, but if you trace over the interior degrees of freedom, outside you have a non-pure state, which happens to be thermal at Hawking's temperature given by the surface gravity. So that's the story of so sorry, so So the picture of the, the picture of the of Daniel, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. So the um, the usual sort of you know popular science book picture of Hawking radiation, which involves some story about uh, about a virtual pair forming and one falling into the black hole and the other going out. That seems like just a bad way to talk. About. I think it's a bad way. Okay. I think it's a bad way. There, you know, that's just, story, isn't it? It Sorry. is, and but 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 it's it's wrong. I mean, at least I I read things long after Hawking and a guy who said this is a fairy story. You right. Don't show it. Right. This is not what's going on. Right. 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 Yeah. It's, it's, it's a picturesque. It's a picturesque way to popularize the story, but right. 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 I mean, because this story that they told is a wrong story. Historical question: Do you mean that that Hawking? Um, it's that's the way Hawking presented it. Or it's in the history of time. But no, no, that's a different story. But, but, but Hawking right. presumably did it this way. Is that right? Yes. 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 Hawking did it this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hawking did it this, this way. This is the way the derivation. Right. This, right. Is, this is the, this yeah. is the derivation. Yeah. Actually, Hawking was trying to look at the Penrose process right. for fields. Right. Instead of particles, right. studying in principle also rotating black holes, right. and then he found this effect, but found that the effect didn't go away when the black hole didn't rotate. Right, right, right. Good. Is there a non-fairy tale story we can tell that mirrors this in some way? He just told. He just told it. <laughs> you, you want a story that's a real theory? A simple, a s no, I don't. I, okay. I, I don't. I don't know that something that you would say that would do justice to what is going on, okay. and that would not be misleading, and that you could tell in five minutes. I don't know. I, otherwise, I would have told. <laughs> so yes, I know it was complicated, but I wanted to be mystified as. This no, is very helpful. Okay, but I want to uh, think you had a question. I, I don't remember exactly how, how it was. It was the, the question was if I've got the early state and and things are stable enough or quasi stationary enough to be able to, to do things in a reasonable way. But presumably in lots of reasonable ways. I mean if it's you know, if it's sort of close to flat, then I can use all kinds of foliations. And the same at wait times. Whether you, if it goes asymptotically flat, whether you, in addition, it seems like you could demand an additional condition, which is if the late state and the early state agree at space-like infinity about the foliation that you're using. If you 
suit. I mean, I mean maybe well, all kinds of screwy but, stuff. Right, when you say that, because you think if you did that, it would eliminate the effect? No, I, well, I think if you don't do that, then you're going to get all kinds of right. odd yeah. chain of numbers. Right. That right. At least you can pose this if you could, right. and then see what the residual effect right. is. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The, this is what you're doing. The, the, there is a thing. There are aspects of the calculation that are in principle doable, exactly as you say, and this thing, this drawing is for you. Well, it's for everybody, but, <laughs> but okay. If you remember, I hope you remember the conformal diagram of last year where we compactify infinity and bring it to, to this point, right? Should I, I go can... back to, to, the, to this story? I, but you should never ask the. But I'm not. <laughs> no, Travis shook his head, but it wasn't clear whether it was no, you shouldn't go over the story, or no, I don't remember the old story, you should go over the story. So well, I'm not shaking my head, but I, I've seen that before, so I went on to the novel. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Well, I mean, you know, unless know. there is a clap, or I will not go through the story. Okay, so space times that are. Flat. Well, and well, I mean, no, if you're not going to go through the story, let me just check and make sure because this is something that I've talked to you about that I just want to touch. Okay. The condition under which you can do this in a coherent way and, and complete, I mean, you pull in the space time, but it's, but it's open, and then you, you pull uh, in an idealized I boundary. Yep. Those are pretty strong conditions. It's more than just, as it were, as you go far away, the thing gets more dilute or it looks more locally flat. I mean, it's, it's a stronger condition, isn't it, for there to be a coherent, as it were, idealized Well, the, me the, 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 the metric has to drop. The, I mean, there have to exist coordinates that behave like Minkowski coordinates in infinity and where the metric deviates from the flat metric by things that drop down sufficiently fast. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And um, sufficiently fast, faster, the metric has to drop out faster than, than one over, like one over r or faster, the mm -hmm. momentum conjugate has to drop down as one over r squared or faster, blah, blah, blah. And generally, radiation, like gravitational radiation, everything will dilute naturally. There is yeah. a degree of As not the flat space times allow the possibility for gravitational radiation. So space times containing gravitational radiation are included in the space times that are asymptotically flat. Okay. Okay, so this is the this is the diagram. This is this is what we call last time scry minus, which is the region where all null rays and if you trace them back into the past. This, this point would have been I the I minus the asymptotic if it was not that it's filled with matter. The fact that there is matter here it makes conditions here impossible to fulfill, so we did not have that. And here is matter collapsing. So the this hypersurface here, this hypersurface here, is the hypersurface that you are referring to. Here I have my dilute gas, mm -hmm. and outside of that, the space time, this particular space time, is Schwarzschild. Because mm -hmm. I have chosen a spherically symmetric thing, and there is a theorem, very theorem, that ensures that in vacuum, the only solution that is spherically symmetric is Schwarzschild. So here is the Schwarzschild solution. I now, I mean, this thing is, this thing is collapsing, mm -hmm. <coughs> following the detailed collapse of a realistic piece of matter is not so trivial, so, so, so we don't really, we cannot really write the yeah. explicit solution for, for, for this. You can do it in some simple cases, for instance, if you say it's just like no dust, then you can do this. I mean, it should, it should kind of go. Oh, but that's teardroppy at the bottom and come down to it should do this, right? The matter. The matter is collapsing. No, no. But the, at the bottom, the matter, the, the matter region should sort of teardrop so down towards what you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. And being slow. The 
matter should all go to the end of it. And that's precisely why the Venom cause is born. That's here. Okay, so here is the matter. <clears throat> and, I, I, and I can certainly foliate the space then here. And the construction I did was, was at the past on this hypersurface. Right. And the future is, I'm considering this hypersurface. In the interior, the construction is completely arbitrary. I don't know how to choose the modes. Right. In here, I chose the modes that are appropriate for the notion of statistic here. Mm -hmm. And, and well, what Hawking was able to do is look at this, uh, at how the modes transform from here to here. Actually, the modes that are one is able, this calculation is highly non trivial. You cannot even do it in general. He was able to look at the modes that that appear at very late times here. Those are the modes that he was able to really trace down and do an approximate calculation. Because the calculation is not exactly that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's only exact in the limit in which you're right. So, very, very very so, so let me now state the question I had. I think I can state it cleanly. Take, take inertial observers who are progressively further and further out, yeah? and, and relative to the, to the foli early foliation, take an observer who is stationary, you know, his, his world line is orthogonal to the, to, to the uh, foliation. Right. So, so this, this is an observer that is very far out. Yeah, this is what you want. Yeah, but and, but choose him so that so that it, it <coughs> relative to the early foliation, and he could be far away from even. You're starting with a spherically symmetric dust cloud, but then it goes to vacuum outside, right? Okay, you want so, me to start the, the, the observer outside the cloud. Yeah. Okay. And and yeah, and and furthermore, let his initial trajectory be orthogonal to the foliation. Right, so he's as it were stick. He's as it were not moving. With respect to the with, with respect to the orbit. That, that, that's not going to be very good because if that's the case, it's very likely that this guy is going to end up falling into the hole. That guy that is not moving. If he's, he's not moving. He's not, he, he's not. He's not moving. So and the and the so I'm from, I, I you, you know the okay. Earth is going to collapse and you put me. Not in orbit, but just okay, standing then there. Then, 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 then give him a velocity. Fine. Okay. That, that, that's fine. Give him a velocity. Make him the most escape observer. Okay, so it's escape. Yeah. Okay, he escape velocity. Right. And he's going to escape. So could, you could demand that relative to the late foliation, he has the same velocity. I can't. You can't. No, yeah. because you told me he's inert. You told you gave me two things. You told me the initial velocity, and you told me he's inertial. So his late velocity is already determined. Only relative to the late foliation. So there are going to be different ways to continue that foliation. Oh, so you want me to choose the foliation? Choose the, choose foliation. the foliation. Choose the late foliation so, so that, that his velocity is relative to the late foliation is the same as his velocity relative. That would really constrain what you could do. And how do I continue the foliation inside? Suppose that this is the foliation. I, you, you, I mean, we're far away, presumably, if you sort of start with something that is going to you, you, be a fairly natural way to just get pretty much flat, right? Flat hypersurface. Okay, you know, but you get how do you, you, you get how you go in toward the center? I don't care. I'm just because really what we're looking at is what happens. I mean, people always talk about the judgments of the distant observer. And so I'm just tracking this stuff. Right. But the radiation, but the modes that are relevant for the story, I need to trace, I prepare these modes with frequent with momentum k and frequency of omega yes. here. And I need to trace them as they go in I here that. and they bounce back. I understand that. I'm so just that's what I, I'm, I'm just I'm just saying here is an additional constraint. As far as I can tell, there may be many foliation that satisfy the constraints you explicitly state. And the question is, if among those many, here's an additional constraint that you might want to impose. 
namely that, the, that relative to this observer, the early and lates agree about what his velocity is. Right? I mean, this would just choose among, it, 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 would, it, it, it would presumably cut down the class of foliations you look at and, 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 and would have the effect of making certain quantities consistent from beginning to end, or you know, okay. it was a kind of consistency that I, 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 for for these things to be cauchier for synthesis, they better end up here. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay. So late time. You're, you're of course, they're all going to end up there. We, we, they have to. There's space line. They have to end up there. No, there are these that are that end up here. This is space. Oh, line. I see what you're. Um, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Yes, they have to end up there. But still, I don't know if I can. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I don't know if your recipe. I I can imagine doing your recipe for one observer. I don't know if I can fill a region with observers and maintain your recipe. Mm -hmm. I have. I, I will think of it. Okay. Okay. How are we doing on time? Were we? I mean, we're supposed to leave for quarter past six. So we can go for another half hour okay. and pick up tomorrow where we need to pick up. Okay, so now let me get back to the subject. Okay. So the point is that since now the black hole radiates, and from the point of view of observers here, there are particles coming out, and these particles have energy in the normal sense, because here we are in the, in, the, in the asymptotically flat case, so they are carrying positive energy from the black hole. Leads one to believe there are no very clear calculations to, to support this, but that the black hole should lose mass. And if the black hole sh is losing mass and is spherically symmetric, then my Birkhoff's theorem is a uh, is, uh, short shield, and then it should, the area should be decreasing. And then we lost, we just lost the first law of black hole dynamics. The area used to supposed to increase and now it's not longer increasing. And now it's not longer increasing because we are violating one of the energy conditions. The energy momentum tensor in the inside the black the, the black hole the boundary, the horizon, is not is not satisfying the working energy conditions. <coughs> And then the area decreases. However, one notice that at the same time that the black hole area is, in, is decreasing, the entropy of the radiation outside is, in, is there is an entropy now that was not there because there is now radiation outside. And if you do the calculation, it turns out that as the, as the area decreases, the radiation more than compensates. And then this combination, area of the black hole plus entropy of matter outside increases. Similarly, when we drop matter inside the black hole, we could say for all our purposes for an observer, uh, uh, an observer that is outside, this matter has disappeared, the energy, the entropy, if it's there, it's as if it's gone. But it turns out that when you do that, when you drop matter into a black hole, matter with entropy into the black hole, Despite many attempted Gedanken experiments that were supposed to violate this, it turns out that always this combination, entropy of matter plus area of the black hole, increases. I, can you please point me to a place where that happens? That doesn't, I, intuitively, that doesn't seem possible, so I'd just like to understand how that calculates. I mean, the calculation of the entropy and the radiation that it, that it overcompensates, that just seems to be impossible, but impossible. Uh, and I have to look at it. I don't know. Okay. I think Walt does it in his book, Black Holes, the thermodynamic black hole. Uh, part of the theory for space time and black hole. Yeah, I mean, I know that book. Well, I don't remember that part of it, but it's been a long time since I read it. doesn't sound like anything. Do you think that. Because, uh, look, it's normally said. So here, here's a, 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 a two second argument, okay? Let me just do it. We have, the, we have the no hair quote theorems, which aren't really theorems. Um, suppose we accept them, we 
say, outside of black hole, uh, let's just worry about stationary black holes, we don't worry about rotation, I don't know. But outside of black hole, the only signature of what went in is, is, is the ML and F, is the mass they had normal momentum of the charge. And let, let's just forget about my angular momentum, say the mass of the charge. Let's forget about the charge. Okay, so from, from the outside region, that's all you can tell about all women. Yeah? So then you say, well, remember what we said about Boltzmann entropy. Boltzmann entropy is relative to a partition, and partition comes from how you're characterizing these macro states. And it's, it's like saying, well, as far as the outside goes, the partition is just by M. That's it. Any, any kind of matter doing anything of the same M counts as being in that macro state, right? Which means that the volume of that macro state is going to be huge in anything that passes the event horizon in that, in that partition is going to enter a, huge, a region of huge entropy because every possible state you can make out of that much mass lives in that macro state. See what I'm saying? And people often say that a black hole is the maximum entropy state you can have of a given mass m. That's why I'm puzzled, because it, it's like you're saying, well, no, I can extract some energy out and, and shrink the event horizon. And with that little quantum of energy I extracted out, I can turn it into radiation that has even more entropy than I lost. And I don't see how that's possible, because I thought that was the maximal entropy you could make out of that much energy. So when you say you can overcompensate, you can overcompensate for the lost entropy with some state of radiation. I just that's why it just doesn't sound right to me. But I, I, I would just like to be able to check and understand because I'm very puzzled. Yeah. Yeah. The statement, I, okay, I, I see the point, and a lot. But the statement that this is the maximum possible ed, entropy of. Of a, certain, of a certain mass, must somehow, <clears throat> must somehow refer to. I mean, sometimes I put it this way, just so the point is clear. Suppose just in regular space, I have a closet. But the deal is, whenever anything goes into the closet, I don't care about anything but its mass. Put in, you know, put, take a certain amount of mass throw it in the closet and its macro description, if it's in the closet, is now, it's an object with such and such mass, right? So now as soon as I throw it in the closet, the entropy goes way the hell up because the, because the partition now, with respect to those macro states, becomes huge. And then when the guy walks out of the closet, all of a sudden the entropy drops again. This is sort of like David's example in, in Time and Chance. Um, that's you know that that's one way of conceptually thinking about what's going on. Maybe it's wrong, but if that's the right way of thinking about why the entropy of the black hole is what it is, then then it just I, okay, I so just don't so understand this, why. Well, do that. first of all, there is a simple thing to do, which is to do the calculation because we know how to compute the entropy of radiation and we know how to compute the entropy of mm -hmm. black hole. So this no, but there's still going to be a question. Let, let me put it yeah, 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 yeah. So No, no. But, but, so look, Daniel, there's, Daniel, a question, Daniel. There's, there's, there's a question of which, over which I am extremely puzzled and I don't know the answer, which is why on earth would this second generalized law hold? And I have no clue about why it holds. Why it would hold. But I'm pretty sure, but, probably just because of recalling, that, that in this particular situation, it seems so, so, so let me try let me try this really quickly. For, forget about the Hawking radiation. Form a black hole out of radiation. Okay? So you start with a bunch of incoming radiation far away. It goes in, there's enough of it to, you know, it, it gets within the Schwarzschild radius to form a black hole. If if the entropy of the radiation could be higher than the entropy of the black hole. You're suggesting that's, a, that's going to be a counter thermodynamic process. So because the radiation, I don't know what temperature, I mean, you, you throw this radiation at some, in some particular combination of things, 
And the way the radiation is going to come out is going to be with the, I mean, because the entropy of, of how much energy and how much entropy you carry with radiation depends. Uh, yesterday, we, Frank was telling, right? We get a lot, a certain amount of energy from the sun, but it's kind of very high temperature. We radiate it yes. with much low. So it's going to be radiated at a very, very low, if, if you're at very low temperature, and it's going to have a huge amount of entropy. I, but I just, it, it, it sounds like you're telling me the, black, the process of black hole formation, which should be very robust and not, you know, special like a time reverse thing, is something that will generically, will generically reduce, will generically reduce energy. No, no, sorry, I didn't, no, I didn't get that. I didn't because, get that. sorry, I didn't get I told if the entropy, if there's any state or generically state of radiation, okay, you have radiation that has certain energy. A certain mass of work. It's out, it's out far away and it's all focused, it's all being thrown and focused at some point. Yeah. So the initial state has some entropy that's the entropy of the radiation. Yes. It it gets focused in, it forms a black hole because it, you know, we focused it so that it it all goes within short shield radius for that mass, I form a black hole. It sounds like what you're telling me is that the, the entropy of that black hole calculated by the A formula is going to be less no, 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 than no, the entropy no, no, no. of the radiation I no, 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 no. I, was, I don't know when I said that, but if I said that, this is wrong. This, this, is, this, is not, this cannot happen. I agree. This cannot okay. happen. If you throw radiation, the black hole that is, that is going to form, and now you have to think what is the wavelength of the radiation that you are going to throw in, because all the radiation needs to be located in the, you don't want the radiation to pass through and scatter. You want the radiation to concentrate all in a very small region mm -hmm. in, at the same time so that the black hole is going to form. So that you have cross, mm -hmm. you know, you have enough concentrated behind the, mm -hmm. the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, the okay, black hole, okay, okay. The, okay. I see and so and, and, and now this black hole okay. forms okay. and now, now I see the calculation you have to do. Okay. I, I don't know how the calculation comes out, but I see the calculation. And I think the the Planck star paradigm solves a lot of these things also. Sorry? I think, I think the, the, Planck, the new Planck star paradigm solves a lot of these issues. You mean the Robelli story? Yeah. yeah. You know, I never understood that so. But, I, I mean, maybe I can draw a picture at some point. But basically, you just take another copy of that and you glue it on, and then you have this nice diamond shaped um, black hole that becomes a white hole. So I just heard Carl talk about that. I didn't understand it either. Yeah. <laughs> Would you be willing to talk about that at some point? I, yeah, I mean, I can do something very brief. I'm, I'm not an expert, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I know enough that I can drop you down and like that. Okay, no, but, but if I ever, if I said something that suggests what you are saying, then I, I was wrong. You did say something that entailed, it, it suggested, but did not entail what I said. And the gap between suggestion and entailment may be more okay. So now, let me see. Okay, the point is, if you analyze your... I didn't prepare that, that part of the argument in detail, but there are arguments, there are calculations that I once looked at, and I can look for them again, that show that in this Gedanken experiment, that particular combination seems to improve. And then the, then the question is, how do we account for that? Right? You know, one would be able to naturally account for that if there was some story Jump, let me first jump to, to how would that would what would be 
something that naturally would account for the second law. If somehow, if somehow we were able to characterize the number of states, of macro states, of states corresponding to, to a black hole in a given macro state, in some terms, in some in terms of some number of, of degrees of freedom that are now that lie outside the black hole and a number of degrees of freedom that lie in, inside of the black hole and somehow they were they were not necessarily constrained with, 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 with uh, I mean the, 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 there were no constraints in the sense that the, that the total number of states was actually the product of, of, the, of the number of states in, inside and the number of states in the inside and then we would compute, let's say, the ball, the Boltzmann, and this, and now applying the, let's say, the quantum gravity, the quantum mechanical uh, version of Boltzmann. So I'm just computing the number of the number of states. Uh, then the, the total entropy of the total entropy will be simply that, and somehow this would be the entropy, and somehow no, this would be the entropy of everything outside the black hole. And if area over four represented generically the number of, of degrees of freedom inside, uh, in, in, inside the black hole compatible with the existence of a black hole of a certain area, if that was given by area over four, this would account for the story. But there are very good reasons to doubt that this is, that this is the case. <clears throat> In particular, because the number of, even classically, the number of ways you can continue the space-time into the interior so that the exterior part is the Schwarzschild, for instance, the Schwarzschild black hole, is, is extremely is infinite to an extreme. I can do almost anything. And, and Tim, Tim was worried and concerned about this and didn't, didn't think this made sense. So let me try to make a, I just made a statement last time, so now this time I want to make a, make a case for the statement, <laughs> to support the statement. And the case is based on this on following. Let me draw for you the conformal diagram of a Kernel Schwarzschild black hole, which, which we introduced last time. This is the future singularity. This is the past singularity. This is scribe minus scribe plus. And this, the solution, the solution here is a metric that can be written explicitly that we wrote it last time is the Kruskal, the Kruskal solution that has this form ps square is some function of the coordinate x square minus t square, we don't say what function it is, plus another function times d, sorry, times minus d t square plus dx square plus another function r squared, also function of x and t, times d omega, and this is the angular, the, the unit, the, the, the metric, the natural metric of the unit sphere. And these functions can be written explicitly, and this is the space that it represents. Here the coordinates that I am talking would, or here would correspond to, to the coordinate t, and here it will correspond to the coordinate x. But of course, since in this diagram I have compactified, I have changed the coordinates. But this is the, this is the space. The, the solution corresponding to a collapsing black hole, to a black hole that is formed by gravitational collapse, does not represent all of this. Right? That would correspond to something, to, to, to something that would, would have Something like this, representing the center of the of this of the gas uh, cloud, and something like this representing the gas cloud, 
and so this is the matter, and the solution would be only the part that lies from here to there. So that's the that's the space time we have been drawing to the past. But now suppose that I tell you I want to consider a black hole that's, that has area A, and I want to know how I can continue this inside arbitrarily. So I can certainly continue it to this thing, but I can continue it in this way. Moreover, I can take the metric here, and provided that I satisfy the constraints, and the constraints, the constraints on the, the remember, the initial value formulation tells me you should write this, the initial data in terms of the spatial metric and the extrinsic curvature, and the constraints have the following form, basically, the three, the three, the, curve, the Riemann, the scalar of the three-dimensional metric, plus KAB, KAB, minus K squared, or K is the trace, is equal to rho, the density of matter, and something like the derivative of K, a B equal J, which is the you want density of momentum of matter. So provided I satisfy the constraints, I can specify the metric and this variable is free. So let me let me do the following construction. I'm going to do the following construction. Well, actually, actually, let me leave it with that. Let me, from here on, choose the metric arbitrarily to be anything you want. Let me choose the 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 extrinsic curvature to be zero. So this is going to be zero. This is, a, and let me now fix rho to be what needs to be. So I put matter there in this way. This is a very simple recipe to produce a way to continue the space time that will not change the solution outside. Because the, the well-posedness of the initial value formulation ensures that if I change the metric in this region, I will not uh, affect the solution in the future development of this region. So the space-time in this part will be, be exactly the same, and here will be anything. So it seems I can do basically anything inside. Okay? Then, if classically I can do anything, one mechanical some, something extremely dramatic will have to occur to prevent me from doing anything. So it seems completely unreasonable to expect that, that the number inside would be unknown. The, 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 the number of degrees of freedom ah, inside okay. would be bounded I see. and much less by, I by see. something like area or I something see. like that. In fact, there are three types of calculations that I mentioned last time that are supposed to deal with the, that are presented as possible solution, but depending on how humble the person is, best solution to the black hole Entropy. There are calculations, string type, cal the string type calculations, in which they compute something that has nothing to do with black holes. They compute something in a regime, in a regime where there are no black holes. They compute the number of ways you can roll up a string and a D brain in a blah blah blah, so that the certain numbers match the numbers of. charges of, of, of the solution that corresponds to the black hole. But the point is that in that calculation, there is no separation of what is the degrees of freedom that are inside of the black hole or outside of the black hole. So if they are computing anything, they are computing the total number of degrees of freedom of the corresponding object, not the degrees of freedom that lie inside the black hole. They are computing everything. So if they are obtaining an expression that says, this is the air, this is completely the air of the black hole, is the entropy of everything, not of the black hole. 
I think the, the original calculation was for extremal five-dimensional. I mean, it's also for extremal, but even for, yeah. yeah. So, okay. The group quantum gravity calculation computes the degrees of freedom of the counter number of degrees of freedom of the horizon itself. Just the horizon. So again, it's not... There is one calculation. But I, can I just mention, I like, I mean, conceptually I like it. That is, A over 4 might turn out not to be the entropy of the black hole as it were, but the entropy of the horizon. Because if, it, if you're doing if you're doing like these Penrose processes, what you're interacting with is stuff around the horizon, and so you would expect that the relevant thermodynamic quantity would be the stuff around the horizon, and then you'd say, well, of course it goes with the area. Right? You increase the horizon area, and you, you know, anyway, that, I, I can't defend that, but in, in, you know, uh, but, but I, I'm, I'm actually fond of that idea. I would like it. But then, but then, okay, but, but it's hard for me to understand then why somehow this process that during the moment in which it's interacting, you know, as you said, with the area, it's interacting with the area, but eventually all this matter that I, I, I released this brick or this radiation that you threw, and it went all the black hole, it's no longer in the area. It, was, it once crossed the area because it has to, but now it's inside. How is yeah. the area keeping track of that? Yeah, yeah, but no, it's not. So, yeah, is so why is this I mean, one be the one that the other always increases? The, the idea would be, I, I, mean, I can't fill this out, but the idea would be, you, you first of all have to think feel theoretically that even there's always going to be kind of a field around the horizon, and that's going to, so there's going to be some physics of that. And, but anyway, I, I, I don't have a story to tell here, it's just going okay. to So, but the third option, the third option is, what is taking me in that direction, which is this calculation of entanglement, in which what they do, Basically, is take people take a sphere in Minkowski spacetime <coughs> and, and a quantum field in in a simple state, for instance, the vacuum state, and look at the entanglement between the degrees of freedom outside and inside. Basically, you trace all the degrees of freedom that lie inside the inside the the black hole for the vacuum state. And you get something that is proportional to the area. However, the constant of proportionality is infinite. <laughs> to make to make it finite, to make it finite, they introduce a cutoff, which is remove a small shell of thickness plant length around the sphere, and now you get something that is more reasonable. And then people produce all sorts of stories regarding this stretch horizon. The idea that something special happens when you are at a plank length from the horizon. And that's the notion I want to tell you next time why I don't think it makes sense. Perfect. <laughs>